point is that even some of the most intelligent, well-educated people on the planet, that uber-impressive breed called neurosurgeons, can't tell without an awful lot of effort. There's early signs of dementia, very, very diffuse, very, very subtle, very hard to spot. You can be extremely experienced, which means over time, you, you've spent a lot of time doing this. Scanning CT things like this. My voice has just changed. <laughs> And that means, of course, that you have less time to spend with your patient, less time to think of strategies for survival and care, and less time to perform neurosurgery. So this rather brilliant young man who I tracked down and spoke to over the weekend at a university in San Francisco came up with the idea of handling 2,000 scans to a computer to scan. Scans from 1,000 different patients. Guess what? One trial. 80% hit rate of spotting even the earlier signs of dementia. In another trial, 100%. And he's a young man. He's got a long way to go. So this has got a long way to go. So imagine the impact that a computer can just do the scanning, freeing up the brain surgeons to do brain surgery. This is just one simple but quite dramatic example of how artificial intelligence can help us live longer, live better, and be more human because we've just heard Descartes' word, words, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. Being in charge of your critical faculties is pretty high on my list of what it takes to be human. So why do we fear artificial intelligence so much? Why does it scare the living daylight out of a lot of people? And it does, because in research that happily coincided with this talk for an agency that I advise in London, 42% of the people we polled and it was hundreds and hundreds of people, we're creeping up to 1,000, fear artificial intelligence more than they fear Brexit. This has happened over the last few days when Brexit has been in your face with all the sort of uncertainty that creates. Artificial intelligence scares people as well. 50% think that artificial intelligence will have more impact on their lives in the next 20 years than immigration over the last 20 years. And think of the political fallout from immigration. Think what that's done to communities. Think what that's done to our politics. Think, think what that's done to deliver Donald Trump and, and Brexit. Not necessarily the two best things that have happened uh, in my time on this planet. And yet, despite that, only about one in three feel that they are personally equipped for the challenges of artificial intelligence. And if you ask them whether their employer is equipped for the challenge, it's roughly one in five. So we just don't, we're just not ready for it. And the one word that sums up what everybody is scared of is this, jobs. 66 million jobs is a conservative estimate of what artificial intelligence could do as the grim reaper of certain industries. 66 million jobs in just 32 countries surveyed by the OECD. There was a survey done, or a piece of work rather, done by Oxford University five years ago that put the figure at 47% of all jobs in the United States could be damaged by artificial intelligence, and about 35% jobs of jobs in the UK. This is job disruption on a huge scale that even puts into a pale insignificance almost the destruction from the Industrial Revolution, the post-Industrial Revolution. And here in South Wales, you think of one industry in particular, you think of coal. And you think of what happened over the last 100 years to coal. This, my friends, is this town. Cardiff, as some of you hopefully know, was the largest coal exporting port in the world. Think of that. Cardiff University is in what used to be the largest coal exporting port in the world. And back then, about a century ago, a million people worked in coal mining across the United Kingdom, a lot of them here in South Wales. And the way those jobs were destroyed, because there's less than 1,000 now in the UK, and there isn't a deep coal mine left in South Wales, the way that was handled was horrendous. Communities were destroyed. Uh, announcements were made in a callous, reckless, almost malevolent way. And yet, I'm prepared, maybe because I'm brave, maybe because I'm foolish, to stand here as a Welshman and say, I'm glad there isn't a man down a coal mine in Wales today. Some jobs are basically worth getting rid of. This is why. Anyone know what this is? It's not a brain. Lungs. It could be a piece of 
piece of art, piece of coral. It's the diseased lungs of a former miner. They call it black lung disease. And if you have it, you literally can't breathe properly. You have chronic cough. There are men in the South Wales Valleys who have tanks of oxygen delivered to their homes because they have to be plugged up to those tanks of oxygen all week in order to just function. Not to do anything dramatic, but just to breathe. And according to one study in the US, in my lifetime, and I'm older than most of you, but I'm not that old, in my lifetime, 67,000 former miners have died of this disease. So my main point today is just as it was a good thing that machines were able to take over jobs that were literally backbreaking and health destroying, then artificial intelligence now raises the tantalizing prospect of allowing us to delegate a number of soul-destroying jobs, jobs that are so mundane, so mindless, so repetitive, so dehumanizing, that we'd be better off handing them over to someone else or something else in order for us as human beings to focus on things that bring out the best in us. Now, that might not necessarily be being a croupier. But there are more people in the US these days employed in casinos than there are in coal mines. And it may not be the best job in the world, and you may have an objection, moral or whatever, to gambling. But if it's a choice of mining or being a croupier, the latter is safer. It requires you to be charming. It requires you to be well-dressed. You don't have soot over your face, and you don't have coal dust in your lungs. And you're working with human beings, and you're making a lot of them happy and you're working with other human beings, it's essentially a more human role. Another role, why am I showing you a pair of perfectly manicured hands? It's because there's almost as many people employed in nail bars in the US these days as there are in coal mines. And by definition, here in South Wales, there must be more people employed in nail bars. Now, I'm not suggesting the average miner is going to be great at giving you a manicure. That might not be the case. But a strong young man who would have gone down the coal mines a few decades ago is extremely well equipped, I would have thought, usually with a Welsh charm and character as well, to become a personal trainer. That role didn't exist when I was growing up. There weren't personal trainers unless you were royalty. These days, there are 27,000 of them across the UK. A great job that involves working with people, keeping yourself healthy, and also helping somebody else to live longer, live better, and ideally, be more human because their self-esteem is higher, they're more comfortable in their skin, they sleep better, and all the rest of it. So, manicures. Law, accountancy, some of the higher paid professions, they won't be wiped out by AI, but there are aspects about them that gladly should be delegated to machines. We will always need lawyers because law is at the heart of a civilized society. And we need lawyers who are capable of wisdom and judgment and creative thinking and thinking outside the box. But do we need lawyers who are up at 3 o'clock in the morning, away from their family and friends, propped up by caffeine and chocolate, trawling through massive documents looking for tiny little flaws? Really? Do you spend all those years training to be a lawyer in order to be doing that kind of task? So if a machine can do that, then it frees up the lawyer to spend more time with her clients, to do more creative thinking, to try and solve a puzzle that has eluded people by bringing original thought into it, not just machine programming. And even the leaders, even the CEOs. In the old days, when I was your age, CEOs were often, more often than not, people who were socially rather inadequate but were great with numbers. These days, we don't want CEOs unless they can do words as well as numbers, unless they can spell out a vision as well as balance the books, unless they can do empathy as well as analysis, do we? So again, here's an example of how we could change what we value and what we rate. This is a man, recognize him? Anyone play chess? Gary Kasparov, one of the most intelligent men on the planet, a chess grandmaster who beat everyone in sight year after year after year. And eventually, one of the biggest computer companies in the world built a computer to play him at chess. And eventually, he thinks they cheated a little bit, but eventually the computer beat him. And he 
feels very sore to this day. He's reflected very long and hard on this. But the comforting thought from Gary Kasparov is that there are things that computers will never be able to do. And essentially, they are the human qualities that they cannot replace. And if you want me to spell it out in a way that captured my imagination when I heard him at a, another great institution, the Hay Book Festival last year, it's basically saying that a mediocre machine with a great human will always beat a great machine with a mediocre human, because those human qualities are superior. We are above beasts, and we are beyond machines. So this man illustrates the core of all the human qualities. I would say character is something that you just can't imagine a machine showing what we truly mean by character. This guy is Sir Robin Knox Johnson. This is back in 1968, 1969. He became the first man to circumnavigate the globe solo, uninterrupted. He sailed around the world, took him nine months in a boat that, as you can see, is not particularly big, 32 feet long. Imagine being on your own at sea, all the different oceans in the world, all Mother Nature hurling everything she has at you, and you're in a 32-foot boat. Now, these days, there are many gizmos, GPS, self-furling mainsails, all kinds of weather predictors. You could go to sleep downstairs, and the autopilot will take care of it. But even today, I think that circumnavigating the globe would be a pretty tough task, requiring, again, those human qualities, resilience, reserve, determination, and an element of madness, something unpredictable in your character, something stubborn. Again, something that we should value more, perhaps, than we do, something that we should raise up the pecking order in terms of what we look for and what we value and what we cherish. This man may be a character, but he annoys me because it's the worst essay title I ever got. A long time ago, I was sent packing in another university where I was studying politics, philosophy, and economics, and told to write an essay on the verification principle. And it's scarred on my memory ever since. I'll recite it to you. And as tautologies and empirical hypotheses form the entire class of significant propositions, are we justified in concluding that all metaphysical assertions are nonsensical? Yes or no? It's no. This man didn't quite realize, and it took 40 years for the rest of the best minds in the world as philosophers to realize that the verification principle falls on its own grounds, because it's neither self-evident nor provable, right or wrong, empirically. So he failed. His own test, amazing, but far more significant, was if he had been right, if that's all that is meaningful, is things that we can prove right or wrong, or things that are self-evident, where does that leave some of the most meaningful things in our lives? Aesthetics, ethics, religion, or spirituality. And it's very interesting, when I was thinking of old AJ here, I did an experiment with my son's Alexa, and asked her about aesthetics and morality and religion. And I've tried it. If I've got Wi-Fi here, I'll try it on Siri. Siri, does God exist? I'm going to have to tell you the answer if she can't. I did this earlier anyway. She basically said, I don't know the answer to that. You have to ask another assistant. I then asked, is my daughter beautiful? I don't have an answer to that. And finally, very dangerous question to ask when you're packing a bag to go away for the night. Should I cheat on my wife? Big moral question. I said, you'll have to ask someone else. I have no idea. So if Siri can't tell me whether my daughter's beautiful, whether I'm allowed to cheat on my wife, and whether God exists or not, there's a lot left in some of the most important things for us human beings that Siri, Alexa, dare I say, machines are not capable of helping us with, which is not to dismiss them. They can do fantastic things, as we've heard in other talks today, as well as in the first example that I gave this afternoon. But if we recognize that the human characteristics that perhaps have been undervalued, how caring we are, how compassionate we are, how empathetic we are, how creative, how wise, start doing the list, and you come up with some of the things that will be the last things to be replicated by machines, but the things perhaps that we value most. And if we do, then we must surely, as a society, in terms of our politics, in terms of our individual outlook, we must reward those sort of qualities. We must recruit those 
kind of qualities. We must promote those kind of qualities. And we must make sure that everybody knows that those are the qualities that we as a society, we as humanity, value. And if we do that, then we can turn to our friends and we can say, we'll give you a heart. You do those tedious jobs. You do the mundane, the mindless, the repetitive, the dehumanizing things. They don't care. They don't have feelings. It's one advantage. Hand those roles over to the robots and then raise right to the top of what we value those qualities that bring out the best in us. And if we do that, as my title today is trying to suggest, we could then, with the help of machines, live longer, live better, and be more human. Thank you.